Sure, I'm happy to, to kick things off. So I think there are three big trends that I'm seeing. The first one, which is most related to Signal Fire, is this concept of data-driven venture and having to differentiate. I had a founder tell me once, which I thought was a really hilarious way of saying it. He's like, look, you're a bank. He's like, I look at every VC as a bank. He's like, a bank is a bank. You're going to give me money. And that's what I'm looking for. Uh, you know, some founders are looking for a lot more on the help side and the actual value add side. Some are looking for capital. And we're selling the most undifferentiated asset you can possibly think of, which is money. And so it's gotten competitive. People have to figure out a way to you know, win. Um, so I think being data driven is helping us in a couple different ways. And you're starting to see a lot more early stage venture capital firms really talk about data driven and you're seeing a lot of journalists writing about it and things like that. We take it as an approach to all aspects of venture. So when we break out the venture kind of stages, it's five for us. So it's first sourcing. So how do you find the best companies? And we leverage both a combination of technology and humans to help with the sourcing piece. So we have an entire internal system that's helping us try to take all the signals in the early stage ecosystem and figure out which signals should indicate that we should be looking at that company, which categories are investable, which companies do we think are about to go and fundraise, which founders are the best, which you know people are hiring really quickly that might indicate some, some kind of traction. Uh, can we look at consumer credit card data? Can we look Look at you know any other revenue data that we might have. So combining all those signals in using an algorithm to help us figure out how to weight those is one way that we try to do that, and then leverage the human overlay. You know the next is how do you diligence a company? You know you need to figure out is this the right company to bet on? Is this the right space? Where is the market moving? How does the competitive landscape look like? And again, we think taking a data driven approach there is really helping us. Then it's picking. So how do you select which company? Let's say, as YY mentioned before, she went really deep in the creator economy. Well, it's great to have an entire market map, but then how do you go and pick which company is the one that's the horse you want to back? Uh, and then finally, it's really in the winning and supporting piece. And in the winning, our access and our products surrounded by data and this data sets is helping us win. It's highly differentiated uh, as opposed to just saying, we're gonna give you capital. And then in the support side, we have an entire team of data scientists who do custom projects. An example, very, very early this morning, one of my companies is trying to put on an event for chief people officers. And we were able to go and slice and dice the market and find them their custom lead list of all the people we wanna to invite to this event. And that's just one way we can leverage a lot of these data sets to help with those five aspects. And again, I think that's a trend we were very early to that a lot of people are adopting. The second is this unbundling of venture capital. So we have seen more people in the last couple of years who are solo capitalists, micro VCs, syndicates, rolling funds, angel investors, all that stuff. And I, for one, am excited about this trend. I know some institutional firms feel threatened by this. I like it because to me, the more people who are actively investing, the more diverse that pool of people are, the more founders are going to get funded and the more diverse founders are gonna get funded. And so to me, it's a rising tides raises all boats thing, especially at the earliest stages where there's plenty of fish. I think as you go up the, the rounds and get past series B, it's a lot more competitive and there's fewer companies. If you think about the funnel from pre-seed all the way to call it series D, it's a very steep funnel. But at the earliest stages, you wanna have as many people get a shot on goal as possible. And to me, this concept of unbundling where people are able to write smaller checks and take smaller rounds, but you're getting a lot of people around the table to help you is actually very beneficial. As opposed to only having one venture partner, you might have 10 people who are investing in you, who are incentivized to help, who have different networks, different skill sets, different areas of expertise. So I get excited about that. I'm happy to dive in later to what each of those look like and the definitions and stuff, um, but that's kind of one. And the third big trend is these crossover funds. So we're seeing large funds who typically do a combination of growth equity and public company investing now coming down into the early rounds all the way into seed. And these are multi-billion dollar funds who are seeing that opportunities are existing for them to get in at the early stages and buy up ownership. So now where historically you would only see seed stage funds playing, you're seeing growth stage funds as well as these crossover funds playing. And it's interesting in that I think that's part of the reason we're driving valuations up so much, but it's also making the early stages even more competitive, which I think is why we've even doubled down more on the data angle. Uh, could you talk yeah. about the, the crossover funds a bit more? Like what are they and how they're different from the traditional ways of the fund management? 
why why you might actually have some better insight on that. <laughs> I can talk about that yeah so um the one fund that has been in the news almost every day since the beginning of this year is Tiger Global so some of you might have heard about them and they're just like prolific activity doing one deal on average per day um since like early this year so Tiger is the flagship fund is in the hedge fund space and they invest in public stocks I think more recently, in recent years, they have been getting into private investing, having growth arm to do large growth stage checks. However, as Elaine mentioned, like kind of as the venture landscape got more and more competitive with more and more capital coming into this bull market, what we're seeing is this like increased comp in competition for companies that are earlier and earlier in stage. And the reason for that is because if I'm Tiger Global and I want to invest in the best company like or you know at the series e for example and i want to you know make like 200 million dollar investments in, in these average size companies in order to enter those companies at that price point i will need to have developed a really strong relationship before that right so you have a lot of competitors there for so for them their point of differentiation is capital their funds are like in the tens of billions of size and so they say for us it's like buy an option if I can invest $20 million in a Series B today, that's pennies to me. Like it doesn't matter that much if the company does like amazingly or doesn't do well at that stage. What matters is that if I have made 10, 20, in their case, hundreds of these investments, then I have the information rights to know exactly how they're doing at every point in time in the future to make a best decision on which are the 10 investments I wanna make, you know, two years from now within that pool. So for them, it's like kind of spray and pray kind of strategy. And it works. We'll we'll see how it works because they've been they've been doing this for the last like, I want to say a year or two. So time will tell as to you know kind of the validity of their strategy. Um, but what's really unique about them is so they, because of their large fund sizes and their uh, their hedge fund practice, they've um, heavily rely on consulting firms to help them do diligence. So they, I think they specifically recruit Bain Capital to, sorry, Bain, Bain Co. to help them do customer calls, do market research, to do just like the entire landscape research. And so what they're able to use from that research is the ability to identify potential market winners in a certain category. So with that research, they can go to companies and say, and I've been on the other side of, of this, by the way, where I'm talking to a company in the recruiting software space. And I started building a relationship early with the founder. Founder said, we're definitely not raising before this date. I'm catching up with them, bringing um, them to our partner meetings, kind of further like doing more work on the company. A couple of days later, founder says, hey, I just got a term sheet um, from a large fund, can't say who, um, at a price that's just like, like I would be like kind of, I would, I would, I would be guilty if I didn't take it, you know, like that price point, it's like way higher than his expectations. And they did this within three days. They're giving me another 36 hours to, to say yes. Um, and I can't just, I can't refuse this. So it's like, so like Tiger is like notoriously known for doing diligence in three days and giving a term sheet to founders, like three days after initially meeting them. And that's because they've already done all the background work and research behind the scenes with Bain and spending like millions of dollars on that, like, like upfront. And then when they, when they go meet the founders, they just do a check of the box. Like, okay, are you, are you a real human? You know, like, do you like, do you seem coherent about your vision? Like, are these like metrics that we understand you have, are they, you know, in the ballpark? And if they check the boxes, here's a term sheet. And again, for them, it's this, it's this optionality strategy, right? At that price point to them, it doesn't matter that much. They just need to get in so that they have the option to invest down the road and they get to be priority um, to invest down the road. Now, what is the downside of taking money from Tiger? The downside, if you're an early stage founder, if you're a C, Series A, Series B, which they all invest, the downside is you're not going to get much love from them. And this is true. I, I know I've spoken to founders who took money from Tiger at the seed in the A stage who would come to us later and say, hey, like I'm raising around later on. Tiger wants to invest more, but I don't really want them anymore. And the reason is because Tiger's portfolio is massive. They, at this point, has like hundreds, if not maybe like, I don't know, close to like a thousand private companies at the rate they're going. So how much time do you think they can each at the partner level spend with each portfolio company? 
not much. The time that they dedicate to the companies are the ones that have grown to a certain scale that's going to actually move the needle for their fund. So as an early stage investor, sorry, as an early stage founder, you will get the money from them. You should not expect to hear from them very much. And that's also the other tiger strategy is say, they say, we don't need uh, to take a board seat. We don't need to be involved in the day-to-day -day of your business because we trust you. But in reality, you know, they don't have time to do that. So that's why that's, that's, you know, that those are their terms. And some founders like it because they think, oh, you don't, you know, I don't want investors meddling with my business and have me having to report to them. It's a lot of work. It's, it's actually nice to have that independence. But on the flip side, our philosophy of Signal Fire is very much, you know, we want to be there to help grow a business and support them in ways capital cannot. And we think that's actually more meaningful than, than providing just capital. And so, so there's trade-offs of, um, you know, being involved with a large, large stage kind of investor like Tiger. And then the other risk is that if you take Tiger's money early on and Tiger doesn't want to invest in you further downstream because they think that you're not performing according to their expectation, it's very hard for you to attract additional investors who will come in after Tiger because the price that Tiger sets initially to get into the round, right? For you to say yes in 36 hours, for you to like be so excited about them that you'll not say no, the price is really high. So for someone else to come in, beat that on top of it is going to be very, very challenging. So, you know, um, pros and cons, but we, we certainly felt their presence in the market. So this is really interesting because like, I think what you said, oh, I idolize it, it's kind of like on both direction, like from a, like downstream, like there's this like syndicates and microphones and all this kind of like, I wouldn't say grassroots, but like, you know, like the ones like who have like ground level connections are coming up to build a more like identity based or relationship based or expertise based, uh, you know, potential like, you know, uh, money versus these like private equity who used to like, you know, only deal with like hundreds of millions of dollars of investment are like kind of, you know, uh, reaching into the earlier stage of the investment. So it's kind of like, like what I hear is like there are multiple players that are coming from both directions. Like what's happening here in your perspective and like how should, uh, you know, how should we think about this from a founder's point of view? I think you guys already kind of touched upon it, um, but also from an investor's point of view, like what to look out for and, you know, like how to understand this new trend that's happening. Maybe Iwana, you want to start with that one? And I'd love to hear your kind of thoughts on how this looks for technical founders too, because I do think it's a little bit nuanced in terms of there's a lot of hot companies and they're getting approached on all sides. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I think for technical companies, um, I'll start with something that we do at Signal Fire. Since a third of us are actually engineers, um, we actually try the product and on top of just talking with customers and then we're preparing a feed product feedback document. So if you're talking with us, it's not just the chance of potentially getting money, you're getting kind of like free user research of uh, us trying the product and other people in our network. Um, a trend that I'm seeing in terms of like the ecosystem is um, a bunch of the infrastructure VCs are just spinning out and being solo VCs um, and helping companies with uh, smaller checks. So at least on the technical side, uh, we see also more uh, former founders who are raising uh, funds, um, some in parallel with their companies. Um, and so it feels like it gets more and more distributed. It's very hard, for example, right now, if you're raising for an open source company to top of mind, like what, what firm should I speak with? But um, from the named ones, but if you are just going through like smaller VCs, you can maybe think of like uh, Robin Vassan who like uh, split out from his bigger firm and now he's doing an infra specific um, um, firm. So they're they are getting more and more distributed and clusters of smaller VCs who are maybe uh, contributing with a smaller ownership um, um, to a, a technical company. Another thing I'll add that I'm kind of seeing across the board is to your point, Casey, around it's kind of coming from both sides. Uh, a lot of times people are combining the two, which is interesting in rounds. One of our portfolio companies right now is doing, they're raising a series B and they're raising from a combination of a growth fund and then a hundred founders. 
kind of on the true grassroots community side. These are all angel investors, people who are actively investing, but it's an interesting way to both get the the name, which does come with something of a great VC firm, but also the backing of, and just the institutional, there are a lot of things that an institutional player will bring to the table to help King make a company. I did not realize, so coming from the startup world, one thing that I did not realize at all until I got into the venture side is how much VCs can make companies. I was always of the mindset, the best companies win, the best products will win, and that's just not true. Uh, oftentimes the best products don't win. And oftentimes it is uh, the people you have around the table who can make the right introductions, who can get you the right contracts, who can get you in the news and, and you know the tech crunch and best journalists. That is what makes companies win. It's the execution, it's the go-to-market, and it's the distribution. And I think having people that can really help with that are great. The other thing that can help with that is having a huge army of people who are your champions. And I think that's an interesting kind of play that we're seeing a lot of companies take. And I think the same goes with syndicates and kind of this group like you guys are. I think having an army of people who come from different skill sets and backgrounds, but who are all aligned to help a company grow, I, you know, if I was a founder, I'd be happy to take that money. Yeah, and I think to Elaine's point, um, this is also a symptom of the fact that communities are becoming more and more important for, especially for more technical products. And I think Elaine invested in uh, one company like that. Right. Um, I just to, wanted to open up the floor to the audience here. Uh, if you have any questions, like feel free to raise hands or like just type in your question in the comment section. Uh, this meant to be more interactive discussion. So feel free to chime in here. Um, I, so, so to that point, I wanted to ask, you know, from, cause I think a lot of, you know, folks who are joining this call are like either like, you know, looking to start a company or, you know, uh, interested in investing in early stage companies uh, as an investor. Um, from that point of view, what would be the, the ideal relationship between the, the startup and all these stage, you know, like if you're like seed uh, looking for a product market fit, like what are the ideal kind of dynamics and the, the level of um, uh, involvement that the VC can have? Like if you have any like example, um, I, you know, that'll be really helpful. Yeah, I would say for us, we definitely take the approach of being heavily involved in companies, which is why for for our portfolio, it's a very concentrated one. And you know, eight years in the making of Signal Fire, we only have about a hundred companies that we've invested in over the years. Um, I would say, so for those of you who are interested in starting a company when picking your first institutional investor, I think it's very important to think about you know, exactly how they can help you. And, and the good ones will articulate that to you, like exactly you know, what areas can they help you with company building. As Elaine mentioned early on, you know, for us, like our very clear value proposition is helping companies hire, build out the initial team, um, whether it's engineers, data scientists, PMs, what have you, like round out the team is one big part of what we do. Um, but apart from that, it's also like our advisory network, people who can very kind of in a very direct way, like whether you're a e-commerce founder, you're a um, enterprise healthcare founder, can help you with elevating your go-to-market pitch, your sales, that kind of thing. So to give an example, maybe a little bit more concrete, um, and it's something that, that I was involved in in, in in the recent couple of months is this early stage kind of social e-commerce company um, that we invested in in the seed stage. And these are just two founders, young founders. Um, one came out of Airbnb, the other one came out of Webflow, had an idea around a social e-commerce business and, uh, and they, you know, they, they were interested in talking to a lot of different investors, but eventually I think they went with us and the type of work that we do with them to give you guys an example is like, one is like, we're helping them like build out a team. They're just two founders right now. And they're trying to find their third, um, founding engineer. So we're helping them with that. We're helping them finding someone on the ops side with supply chain. Um, so, so that's one piece. The second piece is there's usually someone on our team at Signal Fire who doesn't matter what stage of investing we do, who is going to be the point person kind of responsible for the, for the communication from the company to, to us Signal Fire's team. So in my case, it was 
it's me and it's something that I like, I love doing. So every Friday, actually just before this call, um, I spent half an hour with, with the team and we just talk about all kinds of topics from, um, you know, whatever strategy they're, 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 they have their mind on to experiments that they're testing to how their recruiting process is going um, to whatever questions. And then I take those big questions. If there are ones that I cannot answer myself, then I bring it back to the entire Signal Fire team and I try to find someone either who is full-time at our team or someone who's in our advisory network to help address the issue. So one person we brought in when we did the deal as an angel investor to invest alongside us um, was the former co-founder of diapers.com and jets.com, um, Nate, who's built a very successful e-commerce business, now part of our network. And he, you know, is a logistics supply chain, like expert, like knows everything to the teeth. And so he was brought in as angel just to like put in 25K in the company. But we meet with him once a month just to like talk about like, you know, some of the some of the logistical kind of operational questions that he has expertise on. So that's just the role that you know Signal Fire would play is not that we like ourselves might have all the answers. Like I definitely recognize that I don't. Um, Elaine is super knowledgeable about go to market and marketing and and Owana is, is amazing when it comes to technical things. So for us it's about finding the right people who can can help them with the specific issue at hand. And so when when you're a founder starting to build your first bit, your, whether it's your first business, your second business, uh, when you're at that early stage, I would really think through like, what are the areas where you have strengths and you know how to do, you have your own networks on, but where are some areas where you could use some help in filling gaps and finding investors that align very closely with that? Another thing I'll add to you is, Look, it's also what the founder wants. I mean, I've talked to founders who are like, I just want money. And I've talked to people who have very specific needs. Um, one company recently talked to is like, we are looking for an investor who's going to help with partnerships. Here are the companies we're looking to partner. We want people that have their existing relationships put in the door. And I actually love when founders are very clear about what they need help with. And I think we are not the right partners for everybody. Nobody is the right partner for everybody. And it's really about aligning the needs and the desires of the company with the right investor at that stage. And the cool thing too, is it changes over time the stage of company, you know, at seed for the next year, they're going to have some very specific needs. Recruiting is always one of them. Go to market is always one of them. And that's why we really triple down on those areas because we know that hundred percent of companies need to grow, need to hire people. That is what you do at seed, uh, similar to a, but after you get beyond that, there are some nuanced things that people really need. And so I think aligning the right investors, and that could literally mean an angel, a growth fund, everything in between with those needs is so critical. And you know, that's where a lot of these communities really come into play of finding, okay, who's the right community? Another example, um, another group in our emerging manager cohort is focused on only, they're called go-to-market capital, GTM capital or GTM fund. And their community is a hundred go-to-market executives at top high growth companies. That's what they help with. But you know, they're not gonna help with recruiting. They're not gonna help with data science. So it's just about aligning incentives. Right, right. And I think we got some like questions in the, the comments section. Um, these, those are all relevant to what we're discussing right now. Um, if you guys want to take the questions. Sure. Sorry. The first one, um, the signal fire investing the seed round. What are the qualities you look for? Can product be in beta or not launch publicly? Um, I'll speak to the ones I usually invest in more of the technical ones where, uh, yes, we've done seeds where the product was in beta or not launched publicly. And then the bet is on the founder. Um, are they somebody who can attract talent? Do they have a high level of insight into what the problem that they are targeting? Um, so it's a combination of um, founder market fit. Um, our uh, belief and conviction in that market, if this can be something big. Um, and um, I think the third point is more around uh, how, how can, they build, can they build a company? Because many times in the technical founders, they are amazing engineers. But for example, can they take the advice from Elaine about go to market and implement that? Can they acknowledge their blind spots and, and hire for those roles, for example? So those are some things that I'm looking at. 
to take the second question of publicly available news. Everyone has their own preferences, um, but what I read religiously almost every day is um, kind of Fortune has a newsletter called Term Sheet. So I think you can subscribe to this, it's totally free. And every day they send out um, this, this email, which outlines like all the deals that have been done um, in venture in both and private equity actually, and mostly focused on venture. And there's always a short blurb about some sort of trend or exciting, interesting news of the day. Um, uh, Tiger has been profiled quite a few times this past year on what they've been doing, but you know, it'd be like a tech company going public or a little write up on some interesting trend or industry, something like that. So I, I would, yeah, I, I love, um, term sheet, I think it's like a very quick, easy, like read just to like get up to speed on like, what are types of companies that are getting funded by who, um, just to like be in the know. And then I think generically, like, I think everyone reads TechCrunch to some extent. Um, I subscribe to that, um, just for like, you know, kind of interesting trends and, and tidbits of news, um, that are, that are exciting to, to, um, to tech. Um, and then apart from that, depending on what industry work I'm doing, I would subscribe to very specific newsletters focused on like a certain type of industry. For example, right now I'm doing a lot of healthcare work. So I've subscribed to this one, um, this one newsletter writer, um, Kevin, who kind of sends me a, a weekly newsletter roundup of all trends in healthcare and all the deals getting done in healthcare and all that. So I think for every sector, there is going to be some point person who writes about it and is known as the thought leader. So I would, if you're interested in a specific industry, I would go find that person's newsletter, subscribe to it um, and read up on, on their work specifically. I threw two others in there that I like, Term Sheet for sure, definitely read that one, but Crunchbase Daily and uh, Launch Ticker are very similar. There's a lot of overlap. Sometimes there's slight differences, but they're all very skimmable. You can kind of just go through. I can address the um, the next question around the growth fund and the hundred founders. So there's at the at the seed stage, there's something people often refer to as a party round, which is when you take a lot of small checks from a lot of people, and it's oftentimes a lot of small checks from a lot of funds. Those are typically looked down upon, and they actually create a lot more headache than help. Uh, when you have a lot of funds in the mix, you have a lot of people who are constantly looking for information. They want information rights. They want parada. They want all these things. And that kind of makes it challenging. I think the incentive that people see or why they're attracted to a party round is, oh, we're going to have all these people around the table and all these funds are promising all these things and they're going to be helpful. Um, how I think it's a smarter way to apply it is to have a lead fund and then fill out the round and carve out more than you would expect and more than you would typically think for strategic angels. And that can include syndicates, that can include micro like $5 million funds that write 50 to 100K checks. And that can include individuals. Um, individuals, micro funds, rolling funds and syndicates will require a lot less information. They will be less of a headache, but all, also they're people that you can reach out to anytime to help. So I think that's the approach I would take at the seed round is let's say somebody's raising $2 million as opposed to taking, you know, 1.8 from a fund, take 1.5, 1.2, and then use the rest of it for the smaller checks. Uh, but just make sure you know what the expectation is on their end in terms of how much communication and how much information they're looking from you. I see there's a question about how to determine whether a founder is capable of hiring, go to market, et cetera. Um, is it Karen? Is that the right pronunciation of your name? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, that's, a, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, Elena Wan and I will probably have slightly different answers, but I'd say the way that I would think of it is when a founder comes to pitch to, to us as investors, um, that is one big data point because when we hear them talk about their vision, what they've done so far, um, how they plan to go from where they are today to A to B to C, not necessarily the rounds, but just like the different milestones in the future, you, you get some idea of how, um, how, how much clarity of thought does this individual have, um, how much kind of almost charisma does this person have and and how much um, kind of experience does this person kind of convey right 
So you get a sense of that. There's no formula to this. That's why this is, this is like investing is always art plus science. The earlier the stage that you go, the more art there is than science. I honestly wish it was just a formula and we can just like do a math equation and like get to an answer. I would be very happy if that was the case, but unfortunately it's not. Um, and so it, it does at the end of the day come down to a question of judgment on like on, on maybe a person or a team. And this, from my experience, takes time to develop. Um, when I when I first, so part of the equa equation is like the 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 founder, right? And what um, what the founder is like. The other part of the equation is what they're building and the market that they're excited about. So both those things need to be true um, for us to be to be excited at the, the seed stage. When I first started at Signal Fire, because I came from a very, very late stage fund like Blackstone, and my my actual work was a lot more formulaic and, and math oriented. We built models, we you know did projections five years from the present to figure out where the business will be. And then we back salt into like whether we should invest today or not. It's a very, very complex formula. But when I first started Signal Fire, even doing Series Bs was considered early stage for me. Like Series A's was very early. Like seed stuff to me was like, oh my gosh, like there's no data, right? Company hasn't even gone out yet. Like, how do I even assess this at all? And one of the partners in our team told me this, which I thought was very, very illuminating at the time. And he said this to me, he said, "Why? Well, what's going to happen is the first many months, maybe six months, you're going to be excited by everybody you meet. You're going to be excited by every idea that you hear about. And the reason is because you've never heard of it before, right? And you, you meet these people who are passionate about what they're doing. And so, and you're naturally an optimistic person. Like I'm very optimistic. So I, I get excited about that and it's contagious. And so you're going to want to make every investment that you come across. This is natural. This is normal for everybody. And then you're going to hit phase two, where after six months, you're going to see some repeat ideas. You're going to meet founders who are becoming, you know, similar to ones you've met in the past, working on ideas that are similar to the ones you've already met with. And then you're going to realize, hmm, you know, all these people are doing these similar things and we have the same kind of questions about their business and no one can really answer these questions. And, and none of them are really, you know, kind of meets that bar. And then you're going to hit phase two, which is the phase of a uh, slight depression. It's like, oh, none of these is going to work. This, uh, <laughs> these are all like, you know, optimistic people with passions and big hearts, but it's just it's not going to work. And then at some point you're going to hit phase three. And this is a phase where you've accumulated enough of a data set in your own brain, um, just from experience, talking to a lot of people, meeting a lot of founders, doing your own research, all of those things. And you're going to have accumulated enough of a volume of data points in your head in a specific subsector or a specific type of founder, such that you're going to be able to pattern match and identify that one anomaly that stands out. And you're going to see, for example, in a company, you're going to say, I've seen five companies try doing this, but you have a slightly different approach and your answers to my questions show me that you are more insightful than everyone else because of whatever, whatever, whatever. And for that, we want to make a bet on you, right? Or, um, or a certain type of founder just will come across to you as like, you know, lots of founders can be very charismatic upfront, but how they manage people, how they actually think about business, like it takes a lot to actually identify those people. And I personally learned a lot of these lessons along the way. And, and so I would say the things I look for now, two years in, is very different what, with what I looked at, you know, when I first joined Signal Fire, even six months um, in. So that, that doesn't really answer your question, Karen, about like, what do you look for? And I know it's, it's, it's not satisfying because it's not very formulaic. Um, but I'd say the the way that I personally take in, a, you know, to getting better at this is more exposure. So the more exposure you have, the more in your own brain, you'll be able to figure out patterns and identify for yourself. Like, what does that look like? But I love yeah. to hear, you know, Owana and, and, and Elaine might have very different approaches to this. Oh, I just want to quickly say that I agree it's hard and um, definitely not looking for a formula, but I guess I just want to see like, how are you all thinking about this? And definitely because when it's an early stage company, there's just no data on like how they can execute this. So I just was wondering like, what are you looking for? Because there is literally no data on like how the execution is going to be. So, yeah. 
Uh, one question I ask uh, is um, for technical founders. I ask them what will they use the money for? Or like, what does the hiring plan look like? And so it's an open-ended question. And if they only answer about you know hiring and engineering, and there is nothing inside about go to market, or it, then usually <laughs> that's something that kind of tells it. And uh, the same when I'm describing about the services, and I'm saying we have Elaine, and she's amazing and doing these things. And if there is no reaction that's also kind of telling that maybe they might have like a blind spot and maybe are not, not everybody's interested to, you know, get coached or get help. And, and that's okay. Different investors, different founders. It's just that I personally prefer to work with those where they admit to their own blind spots and they are aware of them and they want to improve them. I agree hundred percent with what Iwana said. I'm looking for self-awareness. Nobody, everyone is A plus at one or two things and B minus at the rest. And you need to know where you're being B minus or below. And the founders who can identify that early and say, I need help hiring X, it's critical. And then they're open to help. I'll address the next question a, a little bit uh, around how we do our data sourcing. Um, and we obviously do keep this pretty close to the chest, but I can kind of share a little bit about what we do and how we do it um, and kind of what the processes look like internally. So we aggregate thousands and thousands of data sets and data sources, pretty much anything you can think of we have access to. And our engineers build proprietary algorithms to help weight these data sets and weight these signals at C, Series A, and Series B. The things that you're looking for at Series A are going to look wildly different than Series B. The things you're going to be looking for in an open source, you know, developer facing company are going to be wildly different than something that's a consumer like CPG company. And so we take category, we take stage into account in terms of creating the weighting algorithms. Then what we do is we combine all this and create something that we call unified rank. And we, again, split it in the categories of seed, Series A, Series B. So it's Series, so let's take seed. We will take the investing team who focuses on seed once a week, and we go through all the things that have popped up that week as the top alerts in the categories based off of the weighting algorithm. And then I mentioned before, we take this approach of technology plus humans. Technology alone, you know, people talk about the magic eight ball or can you just data, you know, do you just write a term sheet based off of what your algorithm spits out? Absolutely not. You know, that's never, ever, ever going to be the case, mostly based on the conversation we just had for the last question. At the earliest stages, you're betting on people and people is never going to be sourced from an algorithm. So at that point, we have the team kind of go through the list and we triage it based off of either who's connected closely to that team or who covers that category or industry. So that's a little bit of how, how we do what we do. Uh, you know, it definitely surfaces a lot of stuff that we would never see otherwise. It also gives us the ability to do more outbound, but also be preemptive on things that are not actively raising. So what we found, especially in competitive rounds, when you can build a relationship with founders, and this is something Awana does fantastically well. You know, she builds relationships with founders well before they raise, so that when they raise, it's not coming in cold. We have a much better shot at winning that deal because of that pre-existing relationship. And using our data science team and our kind of alerting system, it allows us to do a little bit more of that. Oh, one other thing I was gonna mention. So this question on the advisor agreement is a great one. I'm gonna put in chat, this is what I highly recommend people use when structuring any kind of advisory agreements. It's called the FAST agreement. It is very much like the SAFE. It is a standardized agreement that you can kind of look at the different percentages of based on the stage of company, based on what you're doing, how many hours a week, all that kind of stuff, what the agreement should look like. And it's a pretty simple, easy legal doc. Um, so I think that is that. If you have um, any more specific questions on that, feel free to unmute and chime in. We're happy to kind of address that. Thanks, Elaine. I think uh, you know Stephanie had a question on the HR uh, lead, HR professional when to you know bring them on board uh, from us you know like the different stages of the startups. I actually had this discussion recently, um, and this is coming from not me. This is coming from our. He's actually our head of finance who also acts as our head of HR, and he's helped a lot of companies hire HR. He typically recommends seri beyond Series A or beyond 50 employees is when you're going to want to bring in somebody full time. That was his generic rule of thumb. Some companies choose to do it earlier. I wouldn't do it later. I think also time, oftentimes the person who is kind of managing accounting or finance for some reason has gotten bucketed at the early stages with 
with HR. Uh, my sister actually is the VP of finance at a series B company. And she also is leading their HR function for the most part now. I don't think she wants to, and I think she'd love to get that off her plate, but I see even companies go that far. Um, I don't actually know the history of why those two are bucketed together, but they tend to be. I don't know if either of you guys have other thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think I, I, mean, I think, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Hold on. Um, just from my, my personal experience, I, I think the companies I've worked with at the series A and B, like when, when they typically get to a stage where I'd say 50 employees is a very good benchmark because now I think about the, the companies I work with, that's the stage at which they are typically in need of an HR person or say, you know, someone um, who, and HR is very different than talent, I would say. Those are probably two, two separate roles that um, companies at the stage should both hire not, and not think that, you know, HR would do both talent and HR and, or, and vice versa. Um, but to have both those functions in house at that point, because the team has scaled to a point where you really need org structure design, you really need to make sure that you are well positioned to scale um, the team from here on. And it, the difference from, say, like a Series A company to a Series B company and C company is not going to be the difference between like ten people, right, or twenty people. It's going to be like that growth. It's going to it's going to require even more, way more people exponentially as you grow larger. So setting the foundation um, up like early uh, is really really important. And then I think at that stage, founders typically find themselves involved in way too many things, such that the kind of their their amount of time they can spend on hiring candidates or even like sourcing with candidates just like as a proportion of the time they need to do everything else is going to be become smaller and smaller so they really need someone to help them um, vet candidates and usually the founder steps in to like help close candidates um, towards the end of the funnel so I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it I like the 50 50 person mark yeah, I think something to just um, um, add to what uh, Elaine and Wawa mentioned, um, something that you can do before the 50 mark, um, which will help the new head of HR is um, capture that initial culture of the team. And when I say culture, I don't mean like loosely of like, I don't know, we believe in these things. It's more like what gets rewarded in the company? What are some of the specific characteristics of your top performers? And um, yeah, before it gets diluted, if you capture that, it will be a lot easier for the HR person when they will recruit maybe new people or they will resolve conflicts to know what is the, um, the DNA of the firm. Because if you hire somebody that doesn't share the same culture, um, it will, the antibodies will reject it. And so I think finding out your DNA uh, early on, it will make for an easier um, um, time hiring the head of HR. Ooh, I just saw my favorite question ever in the chat around uh, discussing and kind of sparring on ideas. Um, that is my favorite thing ever. I know different people don't have preference for that. And I think it kind of depends on where you play in the, the stack. I love talking to people who are at the ideation stage. Um, I literally am like, that's, I write a newsletter every week, which is called three things. And it's three business ideas that I see as opportunities in the market. And it's across the entire board. It's everything from consumer, healthcare, deep tech, B2B, you name it. And so, I'm always game. And I think that at most firms, you can find some people that are always game for that. But I spend a lot of time with people who might not have even left their job. They might still be at a Facebook or at a Google or something. And they're actively exploring a couple of different ideas. And, you know, I think it's actually really smart to start having conversations with people like, you know, myself or others that like doing this because I'm sitting at the 10,000 foot view and I'm seeing everything that's happening in the different categories where anybody who's coming at it might only be seeing a really narrow lens. So I can often guide on where to look out for, where are red oceans, where's opportunity, which categories are too small, which areas are venture investors not excited about. So yes, yes, yes. If anybody has, you know, either any of you are interested in exploring ideas or you have friends or other founders who are doing that, send them our way. I see a thumbs up, uh, but yeah, I we have a lot of that in our community, um, and that's why you know, like the session like this is like really helpful for all of us. Uh, you know, from a you know, 
aspiring founders point of view as well as from my investors point of view so um i think we got like a couple more minutes left um does anyone have any questions or any closing remarks that Elaine wanna why why you guys want to add Hopefully this was a fun and useful discussion. I enjoyed it. And it's uh, and great to great to meet all of you guys and to you know hear your questions and hopefully build some strong relationships. Likewise, you can find all of us on LinkedIn and our, our emails are very easy, first name at signalfire.com or um, and yeah, if there's anything else that we didn't cover today or you guys want to chat further, we're all we're all very friendly and, and welcoming with open arms. And thank you for the questions. They were great. Thank you for joining us. Um, um, we'll uh, keep in touch and I'll be sure to pass along uh, your newsletter as well as uh, your information um, to our group as well. So hopefully we can foster a stronger um, relationship as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Our emails are open. Take care guys. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you.